Welcome to lecture 20 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Today's lecture is going to be getting into the books of Colossians and we'll also get into the book of 1 Thessalonians. So let's get started. For the introductory section, letter A, this book was written by Paul and it's directly declared in Colossians 1 verse 1. Then letter B, it was written sometime between AD 60 and 62. This book, along with many of the others we've already discussed, was written during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. This book, along with Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon, those four are the prison epistles. And then letter C. This book was written to the Christians in Colossae. Now, interestingly, this, the apostle had never visited this church. And most likely, the church was founded by an individual named Epaphras who was converted by Paul when Epaphras and Paul were at Ephesus. Concerning the purpose and importance of the book of Colossians, there were two main reasons why Paul was inspired to write this book. Letter A was first to combat heresy. We're going to get into some various different teachings in the book of Colossians that Paul is specifically trying to refute as heretical. And then letter B, was to explain how to live a godly life. How can you and I live a life that is pleasing to God and is a good representation of Him? Now let's get into Roman numeral three. The major teachings in the book of Colossians. Letter A. Colossians explains that Jesus was instrumental in creation and is the head of the church. Now, in chapter 1 of Colossians, Paul gives a great amount of doctrinal information about Jesus, including about his person and his work. First, in verse 13, Paul explains that Jesus has made salvation even possible. And then in verses 15 through 17, he says that Jesus was instrumental in creation. Even though Genesis 1 does not include him, Paul is specific to mention without Jesus, nothing would exist. And the third thing he mentions here doctrinally is that Jesus was essential to the operation of the church since he is our head. And then the fourth and last thing in verse 20, Paul explains that Jesus has reconciled all things to himself. Then letter B. Colossians warns against reverencing the traditions of men. Now, these philosophies of men from their tradition that Paul mentions in chapter 2, verse 8, were not after Christ, but after the world. And apparently, they contextually pertain to certain people judging them based on what they ate, what they drank, and what day they worshipped. Now, Paul explicitly mentions in verse 20 that you and I are not subject to the traditions, but we are subject to to Christ and his teachings alone. And then letter C. Colossians encourages practical Christian living. Number one, we, Paul explains that we should focus on the heavenly and not the earthly. This is where Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 2 that we are to set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth. One reason for this is because Paul says that you and I are dead to the things of the world, so we should not be focusing on them. Instead, we should be focusing on the spiritual since we are alive unto Christ. And then number two, Paul explains that you and I should put on the new man, the new person. Paul tells them and us to mortify or kill the things that pertain to our old person. And those things that he lists are fornication, uncleanness, improper affections, evil lusts, covetousness, which is wanting other things from people that they have, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, and lying. And instead, he urges them to put on the new man, the new person, which is renewed in knowledge of the image of God which is certain things like mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forgiveness, love, and helping others in both word and deed. And then number three, he says that we should perform our responsibilities appropriately. 
much like Ephesians 5. There's no blank here, so this is just basically the same information from Ephesians 5. Paul explains to this church the proper responsibilities that we should have for each other. He says wives are to submit themselves unto their husbands and unto the Lord. Husbands are to love their wives and not be bitter against them. Children are to obey their parents. Fathers are not to provoke their children to wrath. Servants, obey your masters. And masters, be respectful and just to your servants. And then number four. The last topic Paul addresses to the church in Colossae is that they should maintain proper speech. Here, Paul tells them to use their mouths to pray, give thanks, and say things that would be considered beneficial to other, remembering that our words are like salt to food. We can add flavor to them or we can hurt them. Now that we've finished with the book of Colossians, let's move on to the first epistle written to those in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians. Roman number one, the introduction to the book of 1 Thessalonians. Letter A, this book was obviously written by Paul, specifically mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1. Then letter B, this book was written sometime between AD 50 and 51. And most likely, it was written shortly after Paul and Silas's arrival in Corinth on his second missionary journey. And then letter C, this book was written to the Christians in Thessalonica. Now, we pronounce it Thessalonica today, or excuse me, from the Paul's time is pronounced Thessalonica. Today, that city still remains and it's called Thessaloniki. So if you ever hear it pronounced differently, it's because in Paul's day it was Thessalonica, today it's Thessaloniki. Now, the main leadership of the church here was probably Jewish, though the majority of the membership was still of Gentile origin. Then Roman number two, the purpose and importance of the book of 1 Thessalonians. Paul gives basically three main reasons why he was inspired to write this book. Letter A, it was first to commend the church on their spiritual growth, to commend them and say, you're doing a great job for maturing in your spiritual walk with Christ. And then letter B was to answer questions pertaining to the future. As many of us, and probably all of us have, we all want to know what's going to happen in the future. Well, Paul will address many of those issues here. Then letter C is to address some moral and practical issues. Paul is never just deeply theological, like letter B, but he's always practical, like here in letter C. And role number three, major teachings in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Letter A, 1 Thessalonians starts off by defending Paul's ministry to them. He gives two main reasons why his ministry is authoritative. Number one, he says that his ministry was motivated with love and not charisma. Charisma is just a natural tendency that people would have to be drawn to an individual. Paul says his ministry was motivated with love, not with a charismatic personality. And in fact, when he said he came to them and ministered to them, it was not with great oratory skills, which is speaking skills, and not with lots of fancy words, but he came with a strong affection toward them. And then number two, his ministry was sacrificial. In fact, Paul says he was not just willing to give them the gospel, but he was also willing to give his own life for them, if that's what it took. And in response to Paul's ministry and message, he points out that they received his word that he preached to them, not as the word from men, but as it truly was from the word of God himself. Then letter B. 1 Thessalonians encourages believers to live a holy life. In verse 1, Paul says that he desired that they walk in a way that would please God. And in order to accomplish this, Paul gave some guidelines to help them. The first guideline was that they should maintain sexual purity. He tells them that the will of God for them was to abstain or avoid fornication. And 
to use their vessel, their body, for sanctification and honor, not for their own lusts like the pagans do. Then number two, they should show more brotherly love. While Paul is already pointing out that they were showing love toward each other, as was reported even throughout all of Macedonia, Paul still admonishes them to show it even more and more because you can never out-love someone. And then number three, they should behave themselves properly. Paul tells them some ways that they can behave themselves proper, properly was by studying to be quiet, which means literally learning to keep your mouth shut, was also another way is to do your own business. We would say mind your own business. A third way is, he says, to work with your own hands, be a hard worker. And the last one was to walk honestly toward them that are without. That means to live an honest life even toward those who are unsaved outside of the church. And Paul says that this is not only good for us, but it is also a great testimony to the world. And then the last section that we're going to start for this lecture is letter C. 1 Thessalonians details the rapture of believers in Christ and the coming day of the Lord. The first thing he mentions about this is he says that all believers will one day be resurrected. Now, apparently, the people in this church were concerned over those believers who had already died. They were fearful that maybe they had missed the boat on the resurrection. Well, Paul tells them to not sorrow over their deaths because they will one day be resurrected because Christ was resurrected. Paul's point was that those two events are inseparably linked. Paul says if Christ is resurrected, we will one day be resurrected. But if Christ was not resurrected, then we have no hope of the resurrection. And thankfully, Paul had seen the resurrected Lord himself face to face and that gave him the confidence to know that we will all one day be resurrected because of Christ's resurrection. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 20 for BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or you need anything, please do not hesitate to contact me.